<laughs> so, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, Jesus and and the relationship between him and the stuff the church says. That's what we're talking about in this in this short series. What is the relationship between Jesus and the traditions of the church? What is the relationship between Jesus and the experiences that Christians say are very important? What is the relationship between Jesus and the little rules that, that churches sometimes say are essential for the living of a proper biblical Christian life? Uh, last week we started working our way through a part of the Bible called the book of Colossians and we got as far as chapter 1 and verse 14. So this week we'll pick up in verse 15 which says, He, meaning Jesus, Jesus does deserve his own, uh, his own music. Um, okay, cool. Um, never do that for me. Uh, so he, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Um, <clears throat> now, if you lived in the Roman Empire and you heard someone talking about the image of God, you would have instantly remembered the Greek classics that you learned as a schoolboy. You would have remembered that when people spoke about the image of God, they were speaking about the various ways in which an invisible God chooses to make himself visible. Uh, for example, Plato said that the observable universe is the visible image of the invisible God. What Plato meant by that was that as you look at the beauty and the variety and the color and the order of the world in which we live, you get in those things a guide for your imagination, a, a, a clue that tells you something about what God might be like and what God might be into. So this concept in this sentence, the image of the invisible God, isn't a Christian concept. It comes from the world of Greek philosophy. It's a way of talking about something that allowed the mysterious, invisible God in whom people believed to become visible and knowable. So the question then becomes, in the church, what is it that makes God knowable? What are the concrete things that you can put your finger on that say, this is what God is like, this is what God is into? In the church that Paul is writing to in this sentence, people were saying, well, there's this rule that's very important. There's this tradition that's very important. There's these experiences that, that we have in our faith that you need to have in yours because they're very important. And the pitch is, if you do your religion like we do our religion, then and only then, You'll know what Jesus is like, you'll know what God is like, and you'll be on the right track. The subtext being then, that God is known only through the rules of this particular faith community. God is known only through the emotions and the experiences that are available to you in this particular faith community. And in this sentence in the Bible, Paul says, no, that's not how it is. And so he says, Jesus, Jesus, a name we probably don't use often enough in Jesus' church. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, i.e. Jesus is the one who reveals what God's character is like and what God wants to do in our lives. The Jesus, remember, who hung out with strippers. The Jesus, remember, who hung out with alcoholics so much that people accused him of being one. That person, that person who didn't at all get on well with religiously minded folks, that person is the living clue to what God is like and what God wants to do in our lives. Have a look at this. Uh, so this is a conversation that uh, takes place towards the end of Jesus' life. And um, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
when he talks about the Father in this sentence, he's talking about the, the God whom every first century Jew believed to be mysterious and invisible, that being. And Jesus says, if you really knew me, the me who hangs out with strippers, the me who hangs out with alcoholics, the me who's always falling out with those religious idiots at the temple, if you really knew me, if you really got me and heard me and understood me, you'd know that Father, that invisible God as well. Because if you've seen me, you've also seen him. Now in, in the first century, this is an extraordinary, tantalizing statement. So much so that one of Jesus' followers, Philip, says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. This is, this is the goal of every spiritual search, to, to see the invisible God. To know what they regarded as the fountain of, of all creation. The one who exists at the center of the universe, the source of all love and anger and beauty and light and darkness and rage and goodness and kindness, the source of everything that exists. There is no more tantalizing a prospect for any spiritual-minded person than to know and to discover this mysterious being. This is what Philip is asking for in this sentence. I've believed in God my whole life, this fountain of creation. Let me see him. Let me know him. This is what I've always been looking for. Jesus says, Dude, it's me. Don't you know me? The me who hung out with those kinds of people, the me who fell out with those kinds of people, the me who said the things I've said. If you've seen me, you've seen God as well. In other words, I am what you seek. And if you see me and get me, you see God and you get God. And you understand the work that God wants to do in your life. Regarding that work, he goes on to say that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Uh, in ancient texts, the word firstborn can sometimes mean the first person to be born. However, it more commonly means something slightly more nuanced than that. In the Hebrew Bible, the word firstborn is often used as a way of talking about a person who's got a very special place in God's plan for the universe. Um, in the story of the Bible, remember, things are not as they're meant to be. The story of the Bible is a story about paradise lost. It's a story of dysfunction. It's a story of damage and brokenness. And woven throughout that story is another story about the brokenness being repaired about the damage being fixed, about the dysfunction being healed. Remember I said this last Sunday, the Bible begins with paradise, and everything is messed up, and the whole story is a story back to paradise, to healing, to repair, to restoration. And in the Bible, the key players in that, in that story of restoration are called the firstborn. This is a Bible code, if you will, way of saying this person is a key player in what God is up to in the story of life. This person has a key role to play in fixing the, dam the damage, in, in healing the dysfunction. This is what he means when he says Jesus is the firstborn. Uh, it doesn't mean the firstborn as in the first thing in the universe to be created. That would not be a Christian idea at all, that's clarified in the next sentence. He says, for by him, that is Jesus, all things were created. And then he mentions eight specific things. Things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. You'll remember last Sunday that I taught you that the ancient world was a very superstitious place in which to live. Uh, people believe that every detail of their lives was controlled by a wide array of ghosts and spirits and, and gods. And as you can imagine, people were very afraid of these spiritual beings. 
and they did whatever they could to humour them and placate them and get on and get on with them. And when Paul uses the word things in this sentence, things in heaven and earth, things that are visible and invisible, things that are rulers and authorities, things like that, he's referring to the creatures of the spiritual world of whom these people were very afraid and to whom many of them were praying. And he says that Jesus created those things. They are, they're just things. They're nothing. They're, they're, they're just a distraction. They're not at all important. They're nothing you, that you need to be afraid of. They're nothing that you need to be worried about. They're just creatures. So stop being weird. Stop being complicated in your spirituality. Jesus is enough. You don't need Jesus plus all those things. You just need Jesus. In the next sentence, he hammers home this point in case they missed it. He says, he, that is Jesus, is before all things. Pause on the word things again. Things. What things are you worried about? What things are stressing you out? What things are standing in your way? What things are you scared of? What things are holding you back? Jesus is before all those things. And he holds all things together. In, in a city like Colossae, um, informed as it was by the ideas of Greek culture and Greek philosophy, people believed that there was a, how can I put it, like a, a universal intelligence that, hold, uh, that held all things together. Um, so they believed the universe uh, from, from, you know, from the micro to the macro was held together by this universal intelligence. They said that there is something. We don't know what that something is, but there is something that makes all this move, that makes all this work. And the Jewish people who lived in the city didn't like the idea of talking about a something uh, and so instead of speaking about a universal intelligence, they spoke about, about a word of God. So if you were a first century Jew living in this sentence, you would have said somewhere either at the center of the universe or outside the universe, there's God. And God speaks all the time. And it is that word of God, that logic of God, that holds all of this stuff together and makes all of this work. So, so, so here's the culture. People believed that there was a word, a logic, an intelligence that made everything work. And religion and superstition at a popular level was all about trying to make sure that worked in your favor. And Paul says to the church, listen, that intelligence, that, that word that you speak of, it's Jesus. It's Jesus who gives coherence and meaning to your faith. I know you're in a context where, where you're being told that tra the traditions of your church are so important and the emotions and the experiences that, that, that are available in your church are so important and you have to have those things too or you're not a real Christian. You need to understand that Jesus was before all of those things. Before all of those things that people are saying today matter so much, before all of those arguments and discussions and debates and controversies, before all of those things, there was Jesus. So stop talking about those things and talk instead and think instead about Jesus. Next sentence. Now remember, these words were written to a church. They were becoming increasingly confused about the relationship between Jesus and the religious supplements that Christians were saying were, were essential for the Christian faith. And so he says, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. If you asked a, a cosmologist in ancient Greece to describe the universe, one of the words that he would have used to describe the universe was the word body. And he would have said that there is a relationship between the intelligence that makes the universe work and, and the rest of the universe. Uh, it's all connected. There's a symbiotic relationship. And in that regard, uh, their philosophy was essentially a green philosophy. Uh, they said, we live in the universe and we are part of the universe. 
the same atoms that are in us are the same atoms that, that, that make the stars and the planets and all that stuff. There is, there is an essential relationship between us and the world in which we exist. And Paul applies that thinking to the relationship between Jesus and the church. And so the idea in this sentence is that the church is Jesus. So it's not in the New Testament that Jesus started this church thing, gave it a few general guidelines, went up to heaven and left the church to evolve and develop on its own independently of him. That's not the New Testament teaching. The New Testament teaching is that Jesus is the church and the church is Jesus. And so what that means at a practical level is that the church represents Jesus to the community in which it exists. This explains, does it not, why people think Jesus is irrelevant. Why do people think Jesus is irrelevant? Because the church is irrelevant. Why do people think Jesus is, 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 is angry and bitter? Because the church is often angry and bitter. Why do people think that Jesus is bad for them? Why do people think that Jesus will turn them into a worse human being? Because church is often bad for people. Church often turns people into a worse human being. On the upside of this, and the positive side of this, um, the reason why we're so keen, uh, best we can, to, to do things like care for the poor, uh, to do things like make sure church is, is relevant and interesting and engaging, is because that's what we believe about Jesus. We believe that, that we are Jesus to our community. And that, and that we're meant to be doing the things that Jesus would do were he here in, the, in flesh and blood. Um, next sentence. Um, next slide, please. Or maybe not. I don't know where we are. Okay, so next sentence says, For God was pleased to of all his fullness dwell in, in him. Oh, wait. Yeah, we're there. Um... If you lived in the ancient world and you heard the word fullness, you'd, you'd have remembered one of the seafaring stories that you heard from your uncle who was a sailor. Um, this is a word that was used almost exclusively by the first mate of a ship at the beginning of a voyage. Um, if having counted the number of men on board, um, he felt that the ship's complement was complete, he would then go and report to the ship's master and he would say to the master, Okay, we're good to go. Uh, we have a ship's cook. We have a, um, you know, we have a ship's uh, uh, ship's carpenter. We have a ship's doctor. We have the requisite number of officers and men. We need nothing else. There's nothing else that we need for this voyage. We are good to go. We are set. And when Paul says that Jesus is the fullness of God, what he means is, you need nothing else. You don't need the BS of the church. You don't need the silly rules. You don't need the mandatory experiences that people say are essential for Christianity. You just need Jesus. Everything that you need for your spiritual voyage through this life is found in the person of Jesus. And you'll notice in this sentence that he pairs this word fullness with the phrase dwell in. Uh, in the ancient world, the language of dwelling in was the language of the temple. So if you built a temple in the ancient world, uh, you would say upon completion of that temple that, that from this moment on, God now dwells in this building. So in using this phrase with the word fullness, Paul is leaving no room whatsoever for those who are adding stuff to the Christian faith. Uh, for those who are saying it's, it's not about Jesus, it's about Jesus plus. Plus the rules, plus the traditions, plus the, the experiences and all that. Nothing else is needed. No one else is needed. In Jesus, the fullness of God dwells. And he says this is something that God was pleased to do. It seems that the thing that gets God up in the morning is the possibility that you and I might wish to take our dysfunction and our damage and our brokenness to him for repair and healing. God was pleased to have all the fullness of himself dwell in Jesus and through him, notice how it goes on, to reconcile to himself 
word reconcile is a nice word, eh? Reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace, another nice word, through his blood shed on the cross. Conditioned as we are by 2,000 years of Christian culture, uh, we read about Jesus shedding his blood on the cross, and we're immune to its, to its shock value. Uh, the cross, as you know, was the tool with which the state executed its worst criminals. And it was therefore a source of considerable shame and embarrassment for those families whose loved ones died in this way. Think about it. If you had a criminal in the family who was, who was, who was subject to the worst form of punishment that society meets out, you probably wouldn't talk about it. You probably would bury that, that fact somewhere in your family tree. If your grandfather died suddenly when the wooden platform he was standing on gave way, um, you know, you wouldn't talk about that too much, perhaps only to your therapist. And if that person's criminality was such that he was executed for a capital offence, that little nugget of information would be buried very deep indeed. And yet the early church took the opposite view. The early church were very, very open about this. Uh, they said in their, in their world, we are the followers of the Jesus who died on a Roman cross. And the reason they were so open about this was because they understood that on the cross, Jesus was punishing, uh, God was punishing Jesus for their sins and their damage and their dysfunction. Uh, God, in the Bible, remember, is very sticky on this point. In the Bible it says that all sins are serious and that all sins must be paid for and that the price is death. And the justice and the holiness of God require no less and are not flexible on this point. And so when the church was up front about this shed blood on the cross thing, they were saying, here is who I am as a human being. Here's where I fit in to this messed up story of paradise lost. I am a person who has sinned. My sins have been real. And in the Bible, I understand they deserve real punishment. And yet, in the Bible, tied to that idea is the idea that God, my judge, is pleased, actually pleased, to send Jesus, the fullness in whom he dwells, to bear that punishment for me so that I can be absolved of my wrongdoing and reconciled from the God from whom I was alienated. And, and the importance of this central idea is such that, that Paul feels the church needs to be reminded of it. Next sentence. He says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. When Paul talks to a group of Christians, he quite often begins with the word once. So, so let's talk about you. And let's talk about the person you used to be then. You used to be alienated from God. You used to be, you know, outside. Church should always remember what it used to be. So that it doesn't get a wrong idea of what it currently is. But now, he has reconciled you. This is classic New Testament vocabulary. Once you were, but now you are. Once you were, but now you are. Do you ever feel when you... Has anyone read anything on Facebook this week from Christians that, that was slightly self-righteous and horrible? <laughs> no one at all. Okay. Good. Do you ever read things that Christians write or, or hear things that Christians say that kind of gives you the impression that these people have never sinned? That these people have never made a mistake or never done anything wrong? This is why Paul reminds the church of this. Never ever forget what you once were and what you are prone to be. This matters. Um, once you were, and, and, but now you're reconciled by Christ's body through death. Notice the double emphasis. Jesus had a body that was physical. The big point for Paul. The Christian faith is about a historical person who really lived 
and really died and really rose again so that real human sins can be forgiven and real human lives can be transformed. And part of this transformation is that Jesus wants, look at the next sentence, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. The word present in this sentence is quite formal. It conveys this sort of imagery. This was taken a few years ago when, uh, when the Governor General was hot. Um, <laughs> I thought so. Not bad, anyway. So this guy here in the funny hat is the Mongolian ambassador. And uh, diplomatic protocol, as you probably know, requires that when a, an ambassador takes up his post in a foreign country, the first thing he has to do is to present his credentials, and in Canada, to the, that person he presents them to is the Governor General. And so here you see him handing over a, a, a letter, I suppose, and what it says in that letter is, I am the authorised representative of, of the Mongolian people, and if the Governor General accepts his credentials, he can then take up his post within the country. This is the language Paul is using in this sentence. Paul is saying that Jesus wants to present you to God with a set of credentials. And those credentials are that you, regardless of what you once were, regardless of how you've lived, regardless of what you've done, you are now holy, perfect, and without any blemish whatsoever in the sight of God. And on that day, when Jesus presents you to God with those credentials, you will be free entirely from any accusation that God your judge might otherwise bring against you. In other words, on the day of your judgment, Jesus wants to take you to heaven and say of you that you are morally and religiously acceptable to God. Now, of course, you know yourself well enough to know that you're not morally and religiously acceptable to God. But in these sentences, Paul is not talking about, about what you have done and how you've lived. He's talking about what Jesus has done for you and how Jesus has lived for you. In, in this book, remember, it's all about Jesus. Uh, on the cross, God placed your sins onto Jesus and Jesus' goodness and morality onto you so that when he judges you at the final day, you'll be as sinless and as righteous as Jesus. However, note of caution, last sentence. If. The word if is unwelcome, I think. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say you'll be okay if you live a good Christian life. It doesn't say you'll be okay if you believe the right things and do the right things and have the right experiences and follow the right traditions and the right rules. It says you'll be okay if you don't move on from the hope of the gospel. The words established and the words firm that he uses there are construction words. Uh, they have to do in the first century with how strong a building is and how well it can withstand the rigors of <coughs> weather and time. And the point that Paul makes in using these words is that it's all about Jesus. Jesus is the one who died to rescue you from your sin. Jesus is the one who's promised he'll present you to God on the day of your judgment, perfect, holy, and entirely acceptable. And if you trust Jesus for your salvation, if you trust that Jesus is enough, then that day will go very well for you. However, if you start to trust in something else, such as your weird angle on, on the Christian life, or your particular experiences, or your specific emotions, then what you will be doing, in fact, is taking yourself out of Jesus and into something else. You're now in the world of Jesus Plus. And may, in Paul's view, no longer properly be called a follower of Jesus. And so consequently face that final day, whenever it is, without Jesus. So, I suppose I could have said all that in one minute. It would have been more tolerable to us all. The choice for, that the New Testament presents us with anyway 
is that we can is that we can go to God with a list of traditions that we've successfully adhered to, rules we've successfully followed, experiences we've properly sought after, plus Jesus thrown in there. Or we can just go with Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. It's either or from Paul's point of view. <coughs> Pay your money, take your choices. Um, okay. So, yes, in, in, the, in the thought world of the Bible, God creates everything. But remember, the story of the Bible is that what God created very quickly got messed up. Now, now, <coughs> now the Bible doesn't even begin to blame God for that mess. Uh, the c closest the Bible comes to that is to say that God creates everything with the capacity for choice. Uh, you can't love if you're controlling, I don't think. So, so you know, I liked what you said when you spoke about, uh, you know, about love. I think that probably most of us are wronger than we like to think and loved more than we, more than we can possibly imagine. So, so here's the story of the Bible. God creates everything, sets everything up amazingly. But the way things are today are not the way things God are not the way God set them up. Things got very, very dysfunctional very, very quickly. I don't know if God saw that coming or not. But he, um, he, you think he can't I mean he sees everything. He must have I mean it can't be a, a shock to him what each of us does. I mean uh, Oh okay, so now we're not talking about about the universe, we're talking about our lives. That's probably a better thing. No, absolutely not. I don't think God is ever surprised when 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 I screw up. I I don't think that when I screw up, God looks from heaven and goes, "Whoa, I didn't see that coming." <laughs> like Darren's only done that a thousand times before, and I can't believe he did it again. Like honestly, I thought Darren was a saint. Do you know what, do you know what I mean? So 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 no, I don't think. And what's humbling about about the Christian belief in the gospel? Is, is it's a belief that, that, that meets us not at our best, but at our worst. So, so, so there's this idea in the Bible that Jesus died for us at the height of our sin. Fully aware of who we are, what we've done, what we're prone to do, and what we're yet to do. Like, that's a mind-blowing statement for me. God's love for us embraces the wrong we've yet to do. That's a, a Christian notion. Um, and to me that doesn't say something bad about God or, or sly about God. It says something beautiful about him. And, and it makes me feel very safe as a Christian. And it makes me want to rely on Jesus more than my own rather weak attempts at following any kind of Christian tradition or, 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 or rules. I'm, I'm prone to mess those things up, and so are you, and, and so are all the people sitting around you, perhaps especially them. But, uh, <laughs> um, so did, did, does that answer your question? I think it answers it. Yeah, I, you know, for me this is... Don't be an idiot. <laughs> does, that answer, like, does that answer your question? Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Like, um, How many people have been put off Jesus because, because Christians have been idiots? I mean, I, th I think as Christians we often do an amazing job of, of turning people off. Like, think about the Christian message, the core of the Christian story. The world is broken, Jesus came in love to fix it. That's a brilliant story. And yet in the hands of the church it's become boring and judgmental and bitter. You know, sign me up for that. Yeah. You know, so don't be cranky. Don't preach at people. Don't, don't unless you're me and then you're allowed. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you know. I feel some people don't even know that they're doing it. I think that's the issue. I, I feel like they, they think they're helping, but they just maybe don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there, I, I mentioned that. Um, 
what I said about Facebook earlier was because you know there's this is anyone vaguely aware there was a ruling in the Supreme Court in America this week about gay marriage, right? You, know, yeah, and you follow that story, okay. So I got a whole bunch of stuff on Facebook this week from very nice, genuine Christians saying really horrible or things that came across as really nasty and judgmental and 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 like you know the world's gonna end, this is horrible. And Jesus just wasn't in the mix at all. And my view was, and this isn't talking about this issue, but, but all issues, it doesn't matter what happens in life. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what people do to you. You can still, you can still love people as a Christian. No one can take that right away from you. You can still care for the poor. You can still pray for people. You can still be kind to your neighbor. You can still spend time with someone who's hurting and struggling, you know. And and I, I, I think it's kindness and love that see, that see the truest things about Jesus. I think, uh, I think we often fall into the habit of being nasty as Christians because we think that we are the judge of other people's souls. And we forget what we once were. We forget our own sins and we forget what we're prone to be as well. In the things that are holding you back, in the things that you are afraid of, in the things that are keeping you awake at night. I pray that the Lord will bless you and protect you. I pray that the Lord will smile upon you and be kind to you. I pray that he will show you his favour and give you his peace today, this week and forever. Amen.